I, I think being a military family, that life definitely does toss a lot of surprises at you. Un unexpected things can come up. I can have to leave. Um, the job can call can call me away from the family, and I think that can be a really tough thing. At the start of this year, I was away for four months doing training, and I think that definitely caused me some internal conflict, feeling the sense of being away from my family for that extended period of time. And um, I really, you know, it's it, as a father and a husband, it causes me worried to be away for that long. Um, and that definitely brings up conflict. And I think, I, I think at the same time, being able to watch how just adeptly Allie took care of things at home and took care of the kids and kept things running. It, I think even though it was hard, I think that caused our relationship together to grow because I, I, I mean, I, I realized what a, what a capable <laughs> and amazing wife that Allie is. As Griff said, when he was away in Korea, it, there was a time difference and we were 17 hour time difference, which when something came up as I was doing this single parenting thing over here in California and he was there, um, you can't always just call so I had to make a lot of decisions on my own um, and when you're doing that and you've always been a team in the back of your mind you kind of wonder like is this going to cause conflict is this what they would have done or that kind of thing but um, I think just talking about it and making sure that we were communicating and being um, really intentional about that and just praying and being very prayerful about everything that we do um, and knowing that if we just pray um, God's gonna, He has shown us the answer and He always will show us the answer. Well, navigating life's surprises is kind of life. Whether you're in the military, whether you're a student, whether you're, uh, you're raising a young family, whether you're a single person navigating your way through life, whether you're well along in years in life, there's still surprises. And, and occasionally those surprises are like, Surprise! Oh, a party for me! Gifts and food. It's like, woo! This is fun. I mean, sometimes the surprises are great, but a lot of the times the surprises are challenging. And we're going to talk today about conflict and resistance. That sometimes navigating the surprises that come our way are about surprises that are conflict-centered, where there's resistance, tension, human relationships that get tough. And, and all of us are going to face those as well. And the book of Nehemiah is just loaded full of that. Ne ne Nehemiah teaches us that surprises are really a way of life. I mean, for Nehemiah, from the beginning to the end of the book, there's all these surprises. And just in the book of Nehemiah, there, there's nine different parts of the story. It's only th the book of Nehemiah is only 13 chapters long, but there's nine sections that deal with conflict. And we're going to actually walk through all nine of those today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at nine scenes from the Bible, and I want you just to listen to them as I read them and try to get a sense of the conflict that's happening. Then the nine points of conflict, we're going to highlight those and look at what they are. And then we're going to get nine lessons about different ways that we can respond to the conflict that all of us are going to face. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. If you have your Bible app on your phone or an iPad, you can up there and also the passages are on the screen. And we're going to begin in Nehemiah 2, 10 and 11. And each time I'm going to read the passage first. And then I'll kind of give you the context and the setting afterwards. I just want you to hear what's going on and kind of get the flow. And if you've been reading Nehemiah and Ezra, you kind of probably have some of the storyline. If it's new to you, I'll kind of explain and carry you along with the storyline. So here's scene number one. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, remember those names because they're trouble. And they show up again and again. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites, of God's people. And then I love the beginning of verse 11. I went to Jerusalem. Nehemiah says, I went to Jerusalem. So here's scene one. Nehemiah prepares to travel to Jerusalem. He's in Susa, the capital. He feels called by God to go and to rebuild the wall because the city is exposed and they're in danger. So he feels called to rebuild the wall. He goes across the, he goes to Trans-Euphrates, across the Euphrates River, and begins to gather the supplies and get the permissions to go. But before he even gets there, before he arrives in Jerusalem, some people are already upset. You following that? Problems before you even get started. You ever felt that? I mean, they just, they just kind of start creeping up. 
So he's preparing to travel to Jerusalem, the context of the conflict. He's on the way. He's not even there. He hasn't even started the project yet. He hasn't even surveyed the walls. He's just getting ready, and he gets a report. The nature of the conflict, people were upset. Word comes to him before he even gets there. There's some people in Jerusalem, they're already upset that you're even coming to try to help rebuild the wall. How many of you have recognized in life that there's some people that just like to be upset? They're not happy unless they have something they're upset about, right? Have you ever met someone like that? And, and maybe occasionally you look in the mirror and you see someone that can be like that. It's, so it's not just, if, if there's people out there that like to be upset, it's, someone's got to be that person, right? I and mean, we've got to watch ourselves. There's that nature in some people. So there's, they're, they're upset already. Nehemiah's response, I love this. He pressed on, aware, but ignoring. It says in the passage, I went to Jerusalem. Here's what happens. Nehemiah is traveling to Jerusalem. He gets word that people have heard he's coming. People have heard that he's come to, to build the fortification around and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, and they're upset. So here's his response. I went to Jerusalem. He just kind of, okay, people, some people get upset. Press on. Sometimes, so, so, here, so here's, here's lesson number one. When, when facing conflict, sometimes the right response is to ignore it and keep pressing on. Sometimes the best thing you can do when there's conflict is just ignore it and keep moving forward. Well, we're going to have eight other ways to respond. But sometimes that's the best way to respond. I had something happen a while back where I wrote an article uh, for an online periodical. And somebody went online, didn't like my article, didn't like some things I said, tried to make some weird accusations and stuff. And I went to Donna, who does communication at the church here, and, and I, I said, how do I respond to this? And we tried to follow up with the person, and tried to clear it up, and the person just got more upset and then doubled down and said a bunch of things that you know, just were not true and just got all wound up and starts posting things online. So I went back to them and I said, well, how do I respond now that they're like doubling down and getting more upset? She said, you ignore them. And I'm like, but I want to do something. I want to, you know, they're, but they're, they're dishonest. They're, and I'm, wanting, I'm wanting to respond. She says, she says, you don't understand. If you respond, what are they going to do? Respond back. And I'm going to respond again. And then they're going to get 10 friends responding. And it's become this big mug slinging thing of somebody I've never met and never will meet. And they're just throwing. So she said, just ignore it. That was hard. That's sometimes one of the hardest responses. But, but Nehemiah goes, I'm heading to Jerusalem. They're upset. I'm going to Jerusalem. He doesn't write him a letter and say, I hope you'll be happy with me. He just goes. And sometimes that's the right response. Scene two. We're just going to walk through the whole book of Nehemiah here. Scene two. Nehemiah chapter two, verses 19 and 20. But when Sanballat the Huronite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab, now the, the, group's, the negative group is growing, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king by building this wall? You are being a rebel. Well, actually, he's under the command of the king, but they're accusing him of rebelling against the king. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success we are his servants and will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now he responds, because now they're intensifying their attack. Here's scene two. Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. He starts to lay the groundwork. He's just laying the groundwork of the wall. He's just getting started. So the context is kind of just at the beginning. Sometimes when you're just starting down a road, conflict already starts finding its way to you. The nature of the conflict, now it's mocking and lies. There's verbal attacks. They actually say, you're rebelling against the king. It's exactly the opposite. The king not only said that they could go, but the king actually gave them money and supplies to go. And letters keeping him, giving them safe transport, but they're accused of the exact opposite of what they're doing. People will do that sometimes. because People will lie about things, right? And then Nehemiah's response. I love this. Nehemiah spoke the truth with clarity and conviction. Nehemiah just said, this is what's true. What you're saying isn't true, and, and he speaks it. The, so, so here's the thing. The first thing that happens, he ignores it. The second thing that happens, he speaks to it. How do you know if you're supposed to ignore a conflict or address it verbally? And here's the answer. You ask God's wisdom of his Holy Spirit because each situation is different, and you have to discern God's leading. As I was thinking about this, I thought about something that happened about a year ago here at Shoreline Church, and, that, and Shoreline is such a a good, healthy church, we get very little of this. But somebody wrote a really nasty letter and they didn't sign it. My general response when somebody doesn't sign a letter is I throw it away. I figure if somebody's too cowardly to put their name behind it, they don't deserve to be heard. That's my personal opinion. And in the church, particularly if somebody doesn't like something, they should come and talk about it. That's the godly response. It's talk face to face. And this, but this person didn't send me the letter. 
they sent it to some of our board members. And in this letter, they actually, had, they, they said some things that were just flat out lies. And out of all the, I'll give you a couple of minutes because I'll tell you how I responded. One of the things that they said was, Kevin has hired his wife, given her a cushy job and paying her lots of money, uh, and she's not even qualified for it. Those were three of the accusations of many other ones. I brought it, because our board had it, we talked about it, we just, the, the board said, this, there's not any truth to this. We kind of tossed it out. But in my own heart, I had to deal with this. But I also thought to myself, I thought to myself, you know, if this person's writing this and sending it to our board members, they're almost certainly whispering about this to other people in the church because people who are negative like that aren't just negative once, they're negative all the time. So I got up the, about, after the board talked about this, I got up the next Sunday and I shared with the congregation. I said, if anybody has ever told you something like this, and I, I addressed it head on. I said, if somebody's told you that my wife Sherry was hired by me to do a job she's not qualified for and she's overpaid, I said, here's the truth. Because Nehemiah spoke the truth. I said, here's the truth. She wasn't hired by me, she was hired by somebody else on her staff. Number two, she's not being overpaid because she isn't paid at all. I said, she's been working here for six years and never been paid a penny. As a matter of fact, when she puts on things at her house and stuff, she usually pays for the stuff with our own money, so she's paying to work here. I said, and number three, that she's underqualified. I said, my, I said, my wife has a degree in education, an emphasis in special education, and a degree in theology. And there's churches in our country that would love to have a pastor as trained as my wife is in theology. So I, sh I shared that with the congregation and say, just so in case anybody ever tells you that Kevin's hiring his wife, overpaying her for a job she's not qualified for, it's a flat out lie. Sometimes you have to speak the truth because people won't know. So, there's, so, so sometimes you ignore it, sometimes you speak the truth, right? Scene three, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 4, one through five. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. He's publicly ridiculing them now. He said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? All the stones were burned, broken. It was a mess. And then, so that, that, that's Sanballat. These two guys are the big troublemakers. And then Tobiah, the Ammonite, he brings what I call an ancient burn. You know, you know, like somebody says something, like they say something, oh, burn, gotcha. Here's an, this is the great ancient burn. You might want to use this sometime. It's really cool. He, goes, he says, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Burn. He's like, gotcha. Even a little fox, a little skinny, little lightweighted fox climb on your, your, your walls. That's how pathetic your wall is. Pretty good burn, right? Yeah. So anyway, so he throws it out at him. But now watch, watch Nehemiah's response. I love this. He goes to prayer. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Here's the scene. Work on the wall is going along well. Progresses can be seen. I mean, things are going well. It's positive. But, but the, the context is there's serious movement forward. Sometimes when you're moving forward, things are going well. That's when the attack comes or when it intensifies. The nature of the conflict, intensified verbal talk and efforts to discourage and stop the work. There's just more attack verbally trying to discourage the people. But Nehemiah's response, he prays against them and for God's people. Nehemiah prays in two directions, and I love this. Here's the lesson. Lesson number three from Nehemiah. There is great power in prayer. And in those moments where there's conflict and tension and attack, go to prayer. But I love the way that Nehemiah prays. He prays for the people who are doing the work, and he prays against the ones who are attacking. You're saying, well, wait a minute. It's appropriate to pray against somebody? Well, Nehemiah's not going and attacking them. He's saying, God, deal with them. And God, if you want any suggestions on how to deal with them, I got some ideas. <laughs> you know? I mean, he's, he's kind of like, he's kind of very specific. You know, God, deal with these people. Y you mean when you bump against something horrible or difficult or painful, it's okay to pray not only for strength for those that are in the right, but it's, to, it's okay to pray against those who are in the wrong. I would say yes. I was thinking about this. I thought about something like, like the, the, I, was, I was watching a, a show the other day that was dealing with some issues around human trafficking. There are people on our planet who sell other human beings for work, for services, and the sex trade is horrible. Should Christians pray about that? Yes. And I think we should pray in two ways. I think our prayers can sound like this. Here's one prayer. God, be with those children. That are, that are separated from their parents, that, that, are, that, are, that have been sold off. Be those, with those children who have been sold by their own parents. 
Lord, protect them, watch over them. Be with women that have been sold in this horrible trade. Protect them, set them free. God, deliver them. We should cry in power on their behalf in the name of Jesus. But you can also pray, and Lord, for those people that are bringing about this evil in our world, for those people that are trafficking human beings, God, come against them, break them down, humble them, and let them repent and change, or God, break them to their knees and make them stop. Is that okay to pray like that? I mean, that, that's not a bad, I mean, Nehemiah says, I'm praying for those that are in the right, but I'm praying against those who are in the wrong. And, and we can pray that way. Now, we do it with humility, because sometimes we're the ones in the wrong. But we can pray with passion, both for the good and against that which is evil. And I think that, that's part of God's call. Scene number four. Nehemiah 4, 6 to 9. So we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height. Pretty exciting, because the wall's halfway built. Exciting, good momentum, right? For the people worked with all their hearts. But when Sanballat and Tobiah, there they are again, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod, now the group is growing, this negative group is growing, um, heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Now it ramps up even more. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem. It's getting physical now. And stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. That's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, Nehemiah 4.9. But we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. You mean Nehemiah lacked faith? Shouldn't he just pray to God? Isn't that enough? Why do you have to post a guard if you have enough faith? Because God calls us to partner with him. So we pray to God and we post a guard. And, and, so, and so here's, here's scene four. The wall is to half its height, the context of the conflict, there's success, it's going well, they're halfway there. The nature of the conflict, now it's physical threat and psychological games that are being played. But here's lesson four from Nehemiah. A healthy balance of prayer and action. Imagine a person who says this. I've been praying for two months to get a job. I've been praying and praying and praying. That's all I do. I sit at home, I pray, pray, and pray. Well, have you gone out and, um, I don't know, looked for a job? Have you gone out and filled out some applications? Have you gone out and... No, no, I'm praying. I mean, I'm praying. It's God's job to give me the, God, God's job to give me the job. I'm just going to pray. You go, no, no, no. You, you pray and you go fill out some applications. You pray and you get training and equipped for the new. I mean, you do both of those things, right? I prayed and I got a lawyer. I prayed and I saw a doctor. Because God will do his part, but he calls us to do our part and we partner with him. I prayed and I called the principal of the school. I've talked to families here whose kids have gone through tough things in the school and they're, they're praying for their kid, but they're also calling the principal because they gotta figure this thing out. I prayed and I called a roofing contractor. Well, that's odd. No, I did that recently. <laughs> because remember we had all the big old honking rain, right? It rained in our house in two different places. It rained in our house. Am I kidding, Sherry? It was rain. Thankfully, one of them was over our bathtub and our bathtub was filling up with water. Um, <laughs> praise Jesus. No, but um, <laughs> of all the places, right? But, but I... So I prayed, God, give me wisdom. I prayed, Lord, I prayed, because I don't want it to be too expensive, but I called a roofing contractor, and they came, and they did some stuff, and we haven't had a super big rain yet, but I'm still praying that we don't have any more. But I, we're partners with God. Someone say amen. amen. So, so I love this. Here's how he responded to the conflict. He prayed, and he posted a guard. Scene number five, Nehemiah 4, 10 through 15. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. The people are starting to get exhausted now. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies say, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Now it's gotten to the point of death threats. Now the conflict is intensifying. Look at verse 12. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, Whoever, where, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Even the people around them were terrified. And, and so at this point, what we find out is that Nehemiah says, I quit, that's it. I'm done with it, I'm sick of this wall, I'm going back to Susa because the king's food is really delicious and his wine's really good and I'm out of here, right? No, but this is the point where most of us are going, pack your bags and get out of town, right? Not Nehemiah, he faces this head on. Look at the next thing that happens in verse 13. Therefore, I stationed some people, some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, the easiest entry points, right? at the exposed places, posting them by families with the people they'd most want to protect and work with, with their swords, spears, and bows. They're armed and ready to fight. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, 
And now he inspires them. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And look what happens in verse 15. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. But he doesn't quit. But he doesn't sit there and pout. Here's scene number five. The conditions are difficult. The workers are weary. Sometimes in the journey of life, there's so much conflict. You're like, I'm giving up on this relationship. I'm giving up on this situation. I'm giving up on this dream. I'm giving up on this thing that God might have called me to it, but I'm just, I'm just exhausted. There's those points where you're ready to give up. That's what's happening here. The nature of the conflict. Now there's threats, intimidation, and planned attacks. I mean, they know that things are getting dangerous now. And Nehemiah's response, I love this. Nehemiah gets strategic and inspirational. He just ramps up. <clears throat> okay, we're, okay, this is what they're throwing at us. We're getting ready for it, and we're getting the people motivated and inspired. We're pressing forward. Lesson number five from Nehemiah. Thoughtful strategy honors God. Thoughtful strategy honors God. When things get tough, when conflict is big, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in the workplace, whether, whatever the setting is, when there's real conflicts building up, to say, how do I strategize? Here's what happens with Nehemiah. He says, where's the right place to put people? Okay, the exposed places in the wall. He's being strategic. Who do I put with who? I'm gonna get families together because they're gonna look out for each other. He arms them the right way. He says, remember the Lord. Remember who he is. Keep your eyes on God and be ready to stand when the moment comes. Strategy, inspiration. And there's times where you have to be the one to step up and to bring that to the situation and to bring it for yourself. Uh, last week, we had this card in our, I don't, where is it? We have this card here in our, in our bulletin uh, for a class coming up starting today. And it's called Tools to Strengthen Relationships. This whole class is how do you relate with people? Pastor Dennis is leading this. He's got a degree in counseling. He's, he's got a real uh, practical tools. And I was talking to Pastor Dennis about this class and this topic of conflict. And he said this would be a great class for anyone who's in conflict right now or imagines they're gonna be facing it down the road, especially relational conflict. And as Dennis and I were talking about this sermon in his class, and, and this class starts today from 1.30 to 3 o'clock right in the Parkside room over here at the church. And, and so if you're interested, jump into that class. Come back today for that class. But I was talking to Dennis about conflict. And, and I love it. Dennis said these words. I said, I'm going to quote you on this. And I wrote them in my notes. Here's what Pastor Dennis said. He said, conflict does not damage relationships. How we handle it does. Isn't that good? Conflict doesn't. Every relationship's going to have Conflict. It's what we do with it, how we handle it. And he's leading a four-week class to equip people on how to handle their relational connections and conflict is one of those. And so from Nehemiah, you learn be strategic, prepare, and ready when those conflicts come. Scene number six. Nehemiah 6, verses one through four. When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, Though up to that time, I had not set the doors in the, in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Now watch the tone change. Watch this. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Let's hang out. Let's chill. Let's get together. Let's talk. Right? Now, now they're friendly. Let's get together. But they were scheming to harm me. You bet they were. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? So he writes out this response. Not gonna come. This is the reason. I'm focused on what God has me doing. I'm not gonna come down and spend time with you. Four times they sent me the same message. Each time I gave them the same answer. And so again and again and again, they're coming. And now it's this, it's this hey, let's sit. Let's talk. They have no interest in talking with him. They want him dead. They want him out of the way. But they're playing the car, their cards another way. Here's scene number six. The job is almost done. It's almost complete. You can see the finish line. You know there's times when you can see the finish line? That's the toughest part of the race. Any of you do extreme sports or distance racing, when you see the finish line, it's, oh, it's easy, right? Sometimes that's the last press to get to the end of the, end of the race. And so they're there. The walls are built. You know, the gate, they're, they're, they're making the doors to set in the gates to close the city in, to secure the city. They're, they're almost there. So context, they're almost, they're almost there. The nature of the conflict, there's deceit and distraction. They're deceiving them, distracted. They're, Nehemiah, come meet with us, talk with us. And Nehemiah's response, what I am doing is way too important to stop. Nehemiah says this one powerful word, no. 
not coming, not meeting with you, staying focused on what I'm doing here. I wrote a book that came out last year called No is a Beautiful Word. The whole, there's 68 chapters in the book. Every, and they, they're from a paragraph to three pages. And every chapter is how do you learn to say no so you can say yes to the right things. And Nehemiah looks at this and realizes what's going on. And he says, no, I'm not coming. Here's the reason why. I'm staying focused on what God has called me to do. So we can express with clarity in writing if need be that this is why the answer is no. And if someone's pushing and if there's conflict growing, sometimes you put it in writing, you put it out there and you say, this is why my answer is no. Scene number seven. Nehemiah six, verses five to nine. So you think now they've come four times, he's responded four times, now they're gonna back off. Now, okay, now they'll lay off, right? No, not a chance. Look at chapter six, verse five. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aide to me with the same message. Come meet with us, right? And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written. So now he has a letter. And this letter is just a heap full of lies and made up stuff. But he says, here's, he, he, well, we have a letter we'd like you to read. And here's what it says. Have you ever noticed that over through history, the more things change, the more they stay the same? Does any, do you see any contemporary? Do, are human beings human beings? And is conflict conflict, whether it's BC or AD? Or, I, mean, this, this, I, I read this as I was working on the sermon. I'm like, I plan my sermons a year in advance. And I look at this going, oh my gosh. The, the way people relate and all this kind of stuff, it just doesn't change through history. So they say, well, we, there's, this, there's this letter we got. And it says, it's reported among the nations. And Geshem says it's true. Now, first of all, what does it mean when someone says, it's reported among the nations? What does that mean? Gossip. Oh, yeah, you know, people are saying, we hear, we hear people saying this, you know. And then, and Geshem says, do you remember who Geshem is? He's one of the enemies. So the word on the street is, and Geshem agrees, so it must be true. I mean, it's reported among the nations, Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting a revolt. The worst thing you can do is have a revolt against the king. Against the king. He'll come and destroy you for that, right? You're planning to revolt, and therefore, you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king. And have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. His name is Nehemiah. That's what they're saying. Now this report will get back to the king. So come. Let's hang out. Let us meet together. They say, they say well, there's this, this, you know, here's this letter that tells that everyone's talking about this. Now here's the thing. Who sent Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall? The king. Who paid for the supplies? The king. Who gave Nehemiah passage through from, from where he was in Susa over to Jerusalem? The king. And now they're saying, Nehemiah, the word is you're rebelling against the king, and, and so you should come and meet with us. They're just trying to get another way to get him to come and meet with them. Verse 8, I sent him this reply. I love this. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. Great line. You are just making it up out of your head. That's a technical term for what people call BS. That's bologna sandwich, all right? So if somebody says that kind of stuff, you can say to them, you look at them and say, that's bologna sandwich. You feel free to use that, okay? Um, he says, nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and, will not be com and it will not be completed. And I love how he finishes. But I prayed. Now strengthen my hands. You can see Nehemiah is just like, I'm getting tired, Lord. I'm getting weary of all these battles. Strengthen my hands. Give me strength to press forward. Here's scene seven. The resistors push one more time. The context of the conflict. Near the end, there's this relentless pushing and pushing forward by Nehemiah and the people and against them by their enemies. The nature of the conflict. Lots of people are saying Nameless people and you know, untrustworthy people are saying these things about you. And Nia's response is a formal written reply declaring the truth. And he prays. There's a for, he, he formally responds and says, nothing that you're saying is true. And there's po points where we just have to absolutely put it out there and have to say it. And have to put it in writing. My very first job as a pastor was in a church where I had been the youth pastor and I'd watched the first pastor retire, another pastor retire, and they were at retirement age and they didn't have another pastor, so they made me, while I was in, still in school, become the interim pastor. And the secretary was one of the most gossipy, negative people I'd ever met. So I said to the pastor, the last pastor as he retired, I said, will you do me a really big favor? Will you please fire this woman before you leave? Because she's just, 
people would call and say, is the pastor there? And she'd say this, just like this. She'd say, oh, no, he's not here. Um, I don't know where he is. He doesn't ever tells me where he goes, but he said he's going to visit some shut-ins who are in their home sick, but I know people who want to visit, and he never sees them, so I don't know where he really is. And I'm not exaggerating. So I said, will you please fire her? He said, well, I want to leave well. I don't want to have... So, so he left her with me. So the first week, she's doing the same stuff. I'm in my early, I'm in my like middle 20s, my first church. I'm not even a, officially a pastor yet. And she's doing the same stuff. So I sit her down and I write, I put in writing with the vice president of the church board. I said, if you do this, 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 talk this way, this way, this way, this way, you will be fired. Did I mention she was elderly and a founding member of the church? Um, and so we wrote it all out. And the next week, she did all those things more. And I had it in writing. So you know what I did? No, that's so mean. I'm a Christian pastor. <laughs> yeah, of course I fired her. Um, I did it gently. And then I got flooded with calls from people in the church. Not one negative call. You know what everybody called me to say? Thank you. Oh, she's been doing that for years. Thank you for something. I'm like, why didn't somebody say that? But anyways. Um, <laughs> but put it in writing. Here's the problem. Here's the conflict. And you say, this is what it is. And you press forward into God's will. Scene number eight. Isn't Nehemiah exciting? Isn't conflict fun? No, it's not fun. But, but there's lessons here for our lives, right? Scene number eight, Nehemiah 6, 10 to 15. One day I went, so, so he goes to the house of uh, Shemaiah, who's a shut-in, and now you're gonna have a nice visit with one of the shut-ins, right? Not so much. So he goes to visit uh, Shemaiah, and he said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple. Let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you, Nehemiah. By night, they're coming to kill you. So he says, Nehemiah, go hide in the temple. Now, you have to understand, if you don't know the context, only the priests went into the temple. And Nehemiah was like a standing governor working, in, but he wasn't a priest. And also, it would make him look cowardly, and it would make him break the, break the law about going into the temple. So this, this person is, trying, is prophesying, but being deceptive. And look at verse 11. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because, guess who? Anybody want to take a wild guess? <laughs> Tobiah and Sanballat. If somebody calls you Tobiah or Sanballat, no, don't, 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 don't <laughs> but, but oftentimes we have one of those folks in our lives, right? Or in the workplace or somewhere where they're constantly bringing that negativity, right? Because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. They had actually paid this guy to falsely prophesy and try to get Nehemiah to compromise his character. So then Nehemiah says a prayer. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noida and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed, praise God, on the 25th, and it goes, it goes on the completion of the wall. So here's scene five, uh, scene number eight. It's during the final touches on the wall. They're putting the, the doors and the gates in place. I mean, it's basically, you're, you're done. You're crossing the finish line. Can the conflict stop now? It doesn't. It continues. The context, final touches of the wall are being finished. The gates are being put in. The nature of the conflict, religious deception and character assassination. This, this book is well over 2,000 years old. But, it, but it, it, it feels like it was written yesterday because this is how human beings, this is how we interact at times. And so Nehemiah's response, no, that is not who I am, and some prayer. Lesson number eight, hold to your character and who you are in Jesus. Whatever conflict you face, hold to your character in Jesus Christ. One of my biggest challenges is this. When I face conflict, I want to ramp up and just go after somebody. And I've learned that that's oftentimes I need to ignore it. Sometimes I need to put something in writing. Sometimes I need to pray and post a guard. Sometimes I need to directly come back against the person. But I need to be careful and say, God, what is the right response in this moment and this conflict? And they're trying to get him to run to the temple, to lock the doors, to be a coward. He says, that's not who I am. I know my character. I know who I am. And then at this point in the story, the wall's completed. Things are going great. Nehemiah actually goes back to Susa, back to the capital. But later on, he comes back to Jerusalem. And of course, everything's going to be fine, right? No, more conflict. Scene number nine, Nehemiah 13, four to nine. Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. So one of the priests in charge of the storerooms. He was closely associated with, take a wild guess, Tobiah. 
And he had provided him a large room formerly used to store grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. So there's a space in the temple area for all the tithes and offerings, all the supplies of the work of the, of the ministry there. And this priest, because he's buddies with Tobiah, has cleared all that stuff out of where it belongs and has got this guy who's been a, a pain for, for a long time, now living in the temple. Talk about, talk about a bad call, right? And so, um, verse six, but while, I was, while, I, while this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission, and I came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. But then it says, Nehemiah says, but since I don't like to make waves and cause problems, I just didn't say anything. Anybody buying that? Does that sound like Nehemiah? Remember, he's the MMA guy. I mean, he's the intense guy, right? So we talked about that last week. I mean, so verse eight, I was greatly displeased and you get the sense that this was actually done personally, not, he told, he says, and threw all Tobias household goods out of the room. Just out. I gave orders to purify the rooms, then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Scene number nine. It's what I call the battle after the battle. Now everything's fine, everything's going great, and yet still there's other waves of resistance that can come, so be prepared when you think, whew, Finally, everything's smooth. Just keep your eyes open, okay? Be discerning. The context of the conflict. It's later, Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem after going back to the capital. The nature of the conflict. Compromise and unhealthy alliances. You don't bring in Tobiah or Sanballat to live in the temple after all they've done. You don't put them on the church board, right? You don't put the cat in charge of taking care of all the baby mice. You just, there's some things you don't do, right? And, and yet here he is, right? Nehemiah's response, clean house. Sometimes it's time to clean house. Lesson number nine from Nehemiah. Do all you can to clean house and make things right before God and for people. There's times where you see something, you go, this, this is just wrong, it's out of place, and you have the authority to deal with it. And there's times you say, we're dealing with this. We have to. As a pastor, you hit those moments sometimes. As a parent, you hit those moments sometimes. As an employer and employee, you hit those moments sometimes. And this, this ninth scene just gives us this picture and this reality that, that just when you think everything's fine, there's still sometimes another, another hill to climb, another battle to fight. I, I can't remember, was it Nehemiah or Yogi Berra who said, it ain't over till it's over? Nehemiah or Yogi Berra, what do you think? Yogi Bear, it wasn't Nehemiah. But what Nehemiah is saying is he's saying, it ain't over till it's over. One more hill to climb, one more battle to fight, I'm in. I'll deal with it. And so here's the prayer. We can look at, at Nehemiah's journey and story. Ours isn't just like his. But man, the world doesn't change that much over time. And human nature doesn't change that much over time. And when you face times of conflict, sometimes it's gonna be a moment where you say, you know what? I gotta just ignore that and keep on going. Sometimes you're gonna go, you know what? I gotta pray and I gotta post a guard on this one. Sometimes you just say, I gotta put something in writing. Sometimes you say, it's time to clean house. I don't know the right response, but I know this, when you hit moments of conflict, seek God and seek his wisdom and remember these nine different ways that Nehemiah responded. There's not just one right way to respond, but spirit of God, this is the prayer for all of us here. In the conflicts we face, give us a wise response. Let us not be knee-jerk in our response. Lord, what we look at with Nehemiah and all of these things is he never physically went and, and, really, and really addressed these specific people, but he prayed to you, God, you bring about justice. Sometimes, Lord, we need just to pray, God, deal with this. Intervene. Lord, our hands are weary. Give us strength. There's people here, Lord, right now whose their hands are weary. They're tired of the battle. Lord, give them strength. Fill them up and prepare them for the next step. And Lord, like Nehemiah saw the walls finished, the gates set in place. May we see you take us forward to all you want and have for us in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. And everyone said?